Oh hey YouTube, what's really good? My name is Vivid and this is going to be my attempt at beating a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Brilliant Diamond using only water types. The rules for the run are on the screen now, but I'm assuming most of you know these. If you don't, feel free to pause and read them or a more complete list of the rules can be found in the description below. So why did I pick water for my first BDSP challenge? Well, in a recent video I ranked all the types by their viability in a monotype hardcore Nuzlocke setting, I'll link it in the description down below, but I rated water as the absolute easiest type to use. You're guaranteed a good starter, you're going to have a ton of encounters to pick from in every region, water is great both offensively and defensively, and the list just goes on. It's just such a solid type. So. Since I've heard these games are actually pretty tough since the important trainers all have reworked teams that are EV trained with real competitive movesets, I picked the broken type. Also, I love Weasel, and if I can snag one of those wet weasels early, that's going to be fantastic for me. So water it is. I know this run has been done a ton already, but I think mine is different enough to warrant a watch. Let me know if you agree, and definitely go watch some of the other runs after mine if you haven't already. Also remember, if you enjoy this kind of content and you want to help support me, leaving a like, commenting, and subscribing if you're new here are huge and all go a long way. Okay, let's get into this. I start off by naming my rival Dehydrated because, obviously, Hydrate or Dihydrate, and he threatens to fine us for an absurd amount of money, which is not a very pro gamer move. Something that is a very pro gamer move is browsing the internet with today's sponsor, Opera GX. Take it away, Vivid, from a slightly different time. All right, I'm not gonna lie to you. If you're not using Opera GX as your web browser, not only are you not a pro gamer, you're probably not even a gamer. Opera GX is a web browser developed exclusively for gamers, and it comes with a ton of quality of life features that just help enhance your gaming experience. Probably the most impressive of which is this GX Control Center. With GX Controls, you can limit the amount of bandwidth that Opera GX is allowed to use. That way it doesn't interrupt you if you're streaming music, videos, or playing online games. You can limit the amount of RAM and CPU that your browser uses. That way it doesn't hinder your gaming experience at all. So for all of you out there who need a build guide open whenever you're playing League of Legends because you really don't know how to play any champion and you rely on guides, it's not gonna make you lag out anymore. That's that's me, I'm talking about myself. Other than the GX controls, this sidebar in the Opera GX browser is just super convenient. You can connect a ton of social media apps. I have Facebook Messenger connected. You can connect your Instagram and scroll Instagram mindlessly. You can connect your Twitter and scroll Twitter. And you can also connect Discord and hop in calls straight from your browser. And you can log into your Twitch and then see who's live at a moment's notice and just click on any of those streams and open them instantly. There's a GX player built into the sidebar that lets you sign into Spotify, which I'm already signed into, and you can also sign into all of these, Apple Music, Deezer, SoundCloud, Tidal, YouTube Music, whatever your music streaming platform of choice is, you can sign into it through Opera GX, so you can listen to music all in the same browser, open your Twitch streams, communicate on all these social media apps, and it all comes right here in the sidebar, which is super convenient, especially if you're gaming and you need to manage how many tabs you have open. And finally, there's an Opera GX mobile browser. I didn't know about this. I am so glad I got this brand deal because I've only ever used the default browser on my phone and I haven't been in love with it. This is so much better. It has a built-in ad blocker. It has a lot of the quality of life features that you find on the desktop browser, but just in a mobile format and once again, it's pretty. Honestly, I'm sold and this is now my default browser. I've been using Opera GX for a little bit over a month now because I wanted to test it before just advertising it and it is fantastic. There will be a link in the description down below that is my custom link that lets them know I sent you there and there will also be the same link in a pinned comment in the comment section down below. Definitely go download Opera GX because you kind of have to if you want to be a gamer. I don't make the rules here. I just want to say thank you once again to Opera GX for sponsoring this video and helping me to continue making content. Also, thanks for helping me pay these absurd fines that Dehydrated is charging me. Moving on, we make our way to the lake and then just steal Pokemon, and of course, I pick the little penguin boy because it's the water starter and I name him Mio. I decided I'm gonna name all my Pokemon after my favorite drinks because I also drink water, so I associate water with drinks, so I named Piplup Mio. This seems like a great time to start up some interaction in the comments, so let me know what your favorite drink is down there. Mine is probably just green tea. I love green tea quite a lot. I spend a lot of money on green tea. It's 
Starbucks and other various coffee and tea shops around me. After some intro stuff, Professor Rowan decides that we can keep these starters even though we basically stole them and I'm just gonna go with it because he is really wordy and he talks a lot and I'm ready to leave. I immediately catch a Bidoof and name her Coconut Milk. I won't be able to use her until she evolves, but she has the simple ability which is actually pretty massive since it will double any stat raising moves I use. Ironically, my Bidoof is a modest nature and my Piplup is adamant. I think these are probably the opposite of what I would want, at least I would never want a modest Bidoof. We make our way to Jubilife City drowning some trainers along the way and then we take on these kids in the trainer school and they're actually kind of tough because both of them have Abras that have charge beam, but we're able to squeak out the wins and they give us the team for workup, which will be great for coconut milk. We're then tasked to find some clowns to win a watch, which is just kind of a strange promotion to get a watch, but it's required for moving on so time to float. Now that we have a rolly on our wrist, we can move on, so I head to Route 218 right after getting the old rod and I catch a Magikarp. I wasn't sure if I wanted to use Gyarados in this run because of how busted it is, but also I just want to win this run. It's been really hard to get content out since I'm also a full-time stay-at-home dad now, so I need to use my time kind of efficiently. I mean, I recorded a good chunk of this video while holding my daughter while she was fussy, so I'm just gonna allow it. I really want to get through this game. I name her Red Bull because Gyarados kind of looks like what would happen if you just fed a Magikarp a ton of energy drinks, it got angry and then it could fly somehow, it gives you wings or just lets you float I guess. It made sense in my head when I made the connection. I then spend well over an hour in the Ravage path where I finally run into a Psyduck and I catch it and add it to the team. I name her Coke Zero. Diet sodas are kind of my vice and that has nothing to do with Psyduck really, I'm just letting you know. Now it's time to head to the first gym but Dehydrated shows up and challenges me and for a moment I'm scared because his Turtwig is level 9 and really only one of my Pokemon can do anything, but his turtle doesn't even have a grass move yet, so we breeze past him. And you know what? From now on, I'm finding you. Go drink some water. In Orberg City, some child shows us the gym and calls us a noob, but after a little bit of grinding to catch Mio and Coke Zero up to the level cap, surprise, I absolutely body bag Rourke's team. The only real threat here is Craniados because it's a jolly nature, so it will always outpace my team, but we eat a hit and then one shot it. The Onyx and Geodude weren't even really worth mentioning. I mean, just a Imagine the mono water guy beating the mono rock trainer. Who would have guessed? It's incredible. I know. Hold your applause. We are moving forward and the next gym is probably actually going to be tough. Now we can move on and past Floroma Town we get to grab our next encounter at Valley Windworks, a Buizel. And like I said, I love Buizel and Floatzel so much, I couldn't even really tell you why, I just have fond memories of using one in my first Pearl playthrough and that good memory has stuck with me. I catch her and name her Matcha. I will protect her with my life which basically means I'm not going to use her until she evolves because her defenses are tissue paper. Now I have to save the small child's father, but before I do, both Coconut Milk and Mio evolve, which is absolutely crucial timing because the Valley Windworks fight versus Mars can stop runs dead in their tracks because her Perugly has really good stats for this point in the game, but Coconut Milk specifically is now unlocked to use, meaning I have a fully evolved Pokemon that can essentially set up a Swords Dance by using Workup to fight her Uggo Cat with. I think will be fine. I fight my way through all the grunts to get to Mars and I challenge her. She leads off with the Zubat that confuses me with the Supersonic as I set up a defense curl for that sweet plus two defense boost. And honestly, confusion is pretty good against me since it makes raising my attack more dangerous, so I'm glad I started with the defense boosts first. Over the next few turns, I set up workups while taking a few soft absorbs from the Zubat, and I get to plus four attack when Mars uses U-turn to switch into her Perugly. I go for a headbutt and I even get the quick claw proc, but Grumpy Cat goes for a fake out flinch me. But on the next turn my quick claw activates again and one headbutt makes this cat a very past tense pet. One more quick claw activation, which is three in a row for anyone who's counting, gets me one more quick KO and we can now head towards what will probably be one of our biggest challenges of the run. First though, I run into this pink Shellos and I capture her. I name her Pink Drink. Side note, as I mentioned before, Starbucks probably gets way too much of my money. That aside, I think Gastrodon will be one of our most important pieces later, as a water ground type will be able to completely wall electric types. But unfortunately, Pink Drink has Sticky Hold, which is infinitely worse than Storm Drain as its ability. Never lucky, I guess. 
Now I have to get through the forest with the help of Cheryl, who is honestly not a ton of help. I did notice going through here that some of the trainer battles that should be forced double battles can be done as single battles since the devs seem to have forgotten that you can walk diagonally in these games. Just something to note if you're doing Nuzlocke's, you don't have to do a lot of these battles as double battles, just walk diagonally and press A. Nothing really interesting happens here outside of that, so let's just skip to Eterna City. In Eterna City, we meet this mysterious lady who introduces herself as Cynthia, and she gives us the cut TMs and then asks to step on us, which is kind of strange because of her chibi design, but obviously we let her. Then we get our digging kit, and I'm certain we're about to bust the game wide open with some bonkers encounter in the Grand Underground, but there is really nothing down here for a mono water run. There are some unique Pokemon that you can get early for sure, but nothing I can use. In fact, most of the really spicy encounters in the underground don't really start happening until after you get the national decks, which is why I think on my next run of these games, I'm just gonna start my game with the national decks. Let me know how you feel about this, but I think it could make for some really interesting playthroughs. Now that I've spent some time exploring the underground, I have to come to the surface and face the obstacle that I have been putting off. We all know the next gym leader is Gardenia and her grass types, so I grind away getting Red Bull to evolve, but then I start running calcs. Gardenia's first two Pokemon are honestly not much trouble, but her Roserade? That Pokemon is a massive problem. Thanks to data miners, we have access to each Pokemon's stats for every trainer in the game, and after running Calc after Calc, I really think I only have one option here, and it's not Gyarados like I thought it would be. Gardenia's Roserade has Grass Knot, which it's programmed to use with a heavier weight than Petal Blizzard, its other grass type move, and even though most of my Pokemon are pretty light, meaning a lower base power for Grass Knot, it also has Technician, which gives it a 50% boost to its damage output on any attack with less than 60 base power. So long story short, Grass Knot is always going to hit hard. After running Calcs, this means that Roserade will outspeed and one-hit KO every Pokemon on my team except for Red Bull and Mio. But it will grab clean two-hit KOs on both of them even after Orin Berries. I can also never two-shot the Rose because of its Citrus Berry, so I'm forced to either hope Gardenia plays poorly and doesn't go for Grass Knots, which I estimate would give me about a 5% chance to win, or I can give Coconut Milk a Quick Claw, set up a workup at the start of the battle, KO both Cherubi and Turtwig, then hope really hard that Quick Claw activates and we outspeed and one-shot the Rose with a Headbutt. Quick Claw has a 20% chance to activate, so this seems like my most viable option. With my game plan really being nothing more than hopes and dreams, I challenge Gardenia. I use Workup on the first turn, getting an unnecessary Quick Claw activation here to give myself plus two attack thanks to Simple, and her cherries just set up a safeguard. Next, Coconut Milk slams her head into them and she just gets absolutely covered in cherry juice. The plant lady sends out her plant turtle, but we send it straight back to its ball with the second headbutt, and it all comes down to this. I heard if you like and subscribe right now, it will give us better luck, which we desperately need, so come through, please. She sends out her final plant, a very suave looking rose, and we lock into headbutt. And against all odds, the quick claw actually activates. Our headbutt connects, and at plus two attack, it is enough for the one hit KO. These are the tense moments that make runs like this so rewarding. If I didn't move first there, I would likely be forced to keep resetting until I got a Magikarp with a plus special defense nature. That was insane. Great job, Coconut. You really pulled through for us here. With our second badge in hand, we can now use Cut, which means we have to head to the Galactic Building and save the Bicycle Shop Man, but first we have to battle Jupiter. The fight is pretty simple, her Skunt Tank can be pretty tough, but we have a full team and quite a bit of power behind it. I even let Macha grab the KO on it just for the flex points. With the Bike Man saved, we can grab our bike and continue on. In Mount Coronet, we run into Chibi Cyrus, and I know he is bent on destroying the world, but when he's so small like this, I can't help but think I can fix him. He doesn't need therapy, he needs my friendship. Well, yeah, maybe he has some deep-rooted issues that I can't friendship away. I will be there supporting you though, buddy. We're gonna get through this, and you're gonna go to therapy. On my way to Hearthome City, Matcha evolves, and I am so stoked. Floatzel is super fast and has decent attacking stats, and I really think we needed a fast, hard-hitting Mon to get through some of the late game. So I'll be playing pretty carefully with her because her defenses aren't tissue paper anymore, but they're basically the equivalent of a soggy ham sandwich. We have to fight Dehydrated before we leave Hearthome, but he's still pretty weak, so here's the entire battle sped up while I say we crush him and move on. Don't worry, he'll be a little more threatening later, and by later, I mean much later. He sucks throughout most of the game. 
Heading out of Hearth Home, I grab the Good Rod, which unlocks a ton of encounters for me. So let's count them off. One, a Gold Dean on Route 209, and I name her Sprite Zero. Two, a Barboach on Route 208, and I name him Black Coffee. Well, you know, in my mind, when I first started writing the script, I thought it was way more encounters than this, but I just watched back the footage and that's it for now. We'll add more to the list later, so remember that number. It's two. We'll keep counting from two. Okay, moving on. We make our way into Veilstone and now I am painfully aware of the fact that both Maylene and Crasher Wake have the exact same level cap of 30, and I've just been grinding super willy-nilly, which is not really fantastic news. Some good news though, the casino is gone in the remakes because gambling is bad, so now now we can just buy a ton of powerful TMs in the Veilstone department store, so I stock up on some power including things like Ice Beam and U-Turn, and then we go straight to the gym. I just don't have the experience left to waste any time doing anything other than the gym at this point. While murking the gym trainers, Pink Drink evolves, which is great, but also terrible because it means she is now level 30, and it's not just her. If you look, most of my team is at the level cap. Great. I finish the slider puzzle and challenge Maylene with not a ton of experience to spare. She leads off with Meditite, and I lead off with Red Bull, and I just set up a rain dance on turn one. Gyarados learns Waterfall at like level 21 in this game, so an 80 base power move, powered up by Stab, and then doubled in the rain, looks like it will be enough to just close out this battle, and it is. Surprise, Gyarados is a strong Pokemon. I think I might be the first person to ever realize this. Waterfall drowns Malian's entire team in one hit each, and that's badge three down. I can now go grab Fly and quick travel around the map, which is pretty dope. I also unlock some more encounters, the first being a Whooper on Route 212. I name her Water. I just realized up to this point I've been naming Pokemon after things I drink frequently, and somehow Water hasn't crossed my mind, so her name is super original. Also, this is now my third Water Ground type, which means we're super covered against Electric types, but I still think Gastrodon is the best one I'm going to have access to. I also feel like I should note that right now my team is just Sprite Zero, Black Coffee, and now Water, because my other team members are dangerously close to level 31, so I'm grinding up the newbies and just charging on with them. Water evolves pretty shortly after catching her, which is dope, because now we just have a bigger mud puppy thing. I arrive in Pastoria and head to Route 213 to the right and snag a Wingle. I name her SF Red Bull, or Sugar Free Red Bull, or SFRB. I'll probably be calling her SFRB for most of the time, since she's also a water flying type, and normally I would say Pelipper is wildly less useful than Gyarados, but I completely forgot that Pelipper gets Drizzle, and it's not even a hidden ability. SFRB has hydration, meaning when she evolves, she's gonna get Drizzle, which is honestly both incredibly lucky and is going to help me bust this run wide open. I then head back into Pistoria and we can now add another Pokemon to the list we were counting from earlier, so count with me. Three, a Remoraid. I name him Black T. And also, I really think that's the last number we'll be counting to. The list is not nearly as long as I remembered it being. <laughs> After that, we go into the Great Marsh looking for an incredibly powerful Pokemon and we find it. Look at this little blue water mouse and fear it. For what it's worth, we were guaranteed to find one since there are only two water types in the marsh and we already caught a whooper, but we still have to catch it. I start with my secret technique, Hidden Jutsu Bait Throw, and then I follow it up with a Safari Ball. We get one shake, two shakes, three shakes, and yeah, we catch it. I bet you thought I was leading you up to think it broke out and ran away, but nah, I'd rather be lucky than good, and here, we got lucky. Meryl might look unassuming, but to those of you in the know, you know that it can have huge power as an ability, which would make it a massive threat. I name her Baja Blast, and then we go to the stats page and see that not only does she have huge power, she also is a naughty nature, which is an attack boosting nature. That's so insanely good for us. Azumarill is probably the hardest hitting fairy you can get in these games, so I am stoked for her to join the team. We now have to hit a pretty strong grind session where Baja Blast evolves into Azumarill, and I use her to solo the start of the gym trainers that we have to navigate through to get to wake. Then I head back underground and grind a bit more until Sugar Free Red Bull evolves into Pelipper gaining the much coveted Drizzle ability. I end up teaching Baja Blast Grass Knot and Sugar Free Red Bull Shockwave because for some reason they can both learn these moves and then I pull the rest of my team out and ready myself to challenge wake. This is what my updated team will look like moving forward. I'm benching Coke Zero and Coconut Milk. It kind of sucks to bench them, especially Coconut because of how clutch she was to get badge two, but I would rather than be boxed 
in peace and make room for some powerhouses than for them to get outclassed later and lose them. With my team set up, I challenge Wake, and we start off with the water flying type versus water flying type battle of the century. Sugar Free Red Bull versus the same Pokemon she got her namesake from. This could be intense. But it's not, because I use Shockwave and it crits, so Wake Gyarados just gets fried and falls out of the sky. You heard it here first, Pelipper confirmed better than Gyarados. I mean, I took a pretty hard crunch, but that was never going to be close. I don't think the crit was even needed, to be honest. Also, look at this. When Gyarados faints, basically my whole team levels up to 31. That's how close I was to not being able to use any of my starting players here. The experience share is great, but you really have to manage your grinding in these games. Anyway, Wake sends out Quagsire, so I go right into Baja Blast and take a soft brine. Even though Baja's special attack is pretty mid, a single Grass Knot is enough to drop the Mudfish. Unfortunate, Wake. Unfortunate. His ace is a Floatzel, but for some reason, Azu learns Play Rough at level 25, so, oh. I guess it's only 90% accurate, so a miss here makes sense. Let's just click it again and, oh. Okay, so now we're frozen. Great. We actually remain frozen for the next two turns, and on the turn that we finally thaw, we flinch. The RNG is tilting. On the next turn, we lock into play rough again, and finally, we don't freeze, we don't flinch, and we land our 90% accurate nuke, which just absolutely destroys the lifeguard weasel, because again, its defenses are a ham sandwich. That is soggy, and Baja Blast is strong as heck. I'm still mad about all the hacks, though. Either way, that is four badges down and only four to go. Next up is a bunch of story that we can speed run through. We fight Dehydrated, who is still super dehydrated. Let your Pokemon evolve, bruh. We chase a Galactic Grunt, then decimate him. We run into Cynthia, and she asks to step on us once again, and duh, please do. Then she gives us some medicine to cure some Psyducks that have been blocking our way from making progress in the game, but really, I think we just unwittingly pepper sprayed a group of peacefully protesting Psyducks, which isn't a great look. Cynthia then shows up as soon as the deed is done, and she can no longer be blamed for it, and asks me to deliver some charm to her grandma because she can't be bothered to go visit her herself. You know what? Maybe next time, I won't let you step on me. Maybe. We drop off the charm and spend some time with Cynthia's lonely grandma, and then we run into Cyrus once again who doesn't seem to be taking his therapy very seriously. We'll figure it out, bud. We're gonna get you the help you need. Okay, enough story for now, fifth badge time. Mio finally evolves into an Empoleon while grinding for the Fantina fight, and wow, this is such a solid defensive and offensive Pokemon. Water Steel is just such an amazing type, and the synergy Mio now has with Pokemon like Pink Drink and Sugar Free Red Bull is incredible, so it's time to crush Fantina. Hopefully. She leads off with the Drift Limb, and I just lead off with Baja Blast. The Hot Air Balloon goes for Strength Sap on turn 1, lowering my attack, so it eats a Play Rough pretty well, actually. And then it burns me on the next turn, dropping my damage output to essentially nothing. I switch into Red Bull, taking a Soft Hex, and then on the next turn, I go for a Crunch as Fantina Hills Drift with a Hyper Potion. But surprise, Red Bull is really strong, so we drop the Balloon in one hit. She sends out her Gengar next and it confuses us, but we break through and hit it down to about 25% with another crunch. Not wanting to risk the confusion, I switch into SFRB to set up the rain and take an incredibly strong sludge bomb, which definitely would have killed a fitted crit, so not the best move on my part. I double into Mio, who is now immune to poison type attacks, and a single Aqua Jet in the rain finishes off the Gengar. Fantina goes into her ace, a Miss Magius, and I decide to just go for a brine. The Ghostly Witch goes for a Phantom Force though, which makes it invulnerable for a turn me meaning I can't even touch it. But this is a physical move, and Mag has terrible physical attack, so I switch into Matcha to abuse the rain, but when I come in, I take a soft ghost blast, and then the rain stops because I didn't properly count my rain turns. Oops. <laughs> On the next turn, the witch confuses me, so I just hit myself. I decide not to risk the confusion and switch back into Mio, and it's probably a good thing I did because the Miss Magius has Magical Leaf, and I didn't even realize that. Mio coming in probably saved Matcha here. We go back and forth for a little bit, but eventually Brines drop Mag to the yellow and Aqua Jet is able to pick up the KO and win me my fifth badge. This penguin just now got its final evolution and already it's proving to be such an amazing asset to the team. You love to see it. There's really nothing to do before the sixth badge, so we just head straight there. Dehydrated shows up and this dude definitely still has super yellow urine because he still sucks. His only water resist is a Buizel that could have evolved seven levels ago. We try to hydrate him, but he just drowns. Seriously, man, go take care of your health and do not challenge me until you are hydrated. The next gym leader is Byron, who is, wait for it, also Rorik's father. 
quite the plot twist that doesn't really have too much to do with the story of these games at all. His team is comprised of only steel types, but two of them are weak to water, so yeah. He leads off with a Bronzor who does manage to live a crunch from Red Bull and set up a trick room, but then it just dies to the next crunch. He goes into Steelix who knows Thunderfang, so I switch in a Pink Drink to negate the attack. I then do some switch shenanigans for a while with Pink Drink and Sugar Free Red Bull since they cover each other perfectly here, but then I realize that every single time I set up the rain, Steelix always goes for Sandstorm instead of trying to get the kill on my bird. So I stay in and surf it a few times, dropping it to Sturdy and forcing healing items before finally just dropping it entirely. Byron then sends out his ace, Abastiodon, who also knows an electric move in Thunderbolt, but this time it doesn't even have a neutral move against Pink Drink like Steelix did. So I bring in my slug, and a couple of muddy waters later, we have the six badge. Very cool. Some more story stuff starts happening after we get the sixth badge and we find out that Team Galaxy is blowing up lakes to catch these weird Mew looking Pokemon, so we split up and go check out the lakes. I show up to my assigned lake and mostly I'm just really upset at all of these suffering Magikarp. This is just really not kind. So I drown some space nerds at my lake, go to the lake that Rowan and Dawn went to and drown some space nerds there, then I head to Snowpoint City where I have to earn my seventh badge before looking at the final lake. Okay, now that I've said lake a ton, listen, I have a few things that I need to say about the seventh gym. One, if someone asks you for the gym leader's name, do not say it. Watch this TikTok I made, it will explain why. Hey man, what's up, what are you playing? Oh, hey man, I'm actually just replaying through Pokemon Platinum, you know, trying to get ready for Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. I'm actually just about to fight the ice type gym leader, but for the life of me, I cannot remember her name. Do you know it? Oh yeah, I think it's Candace. That's right, if you fall for this trap without an Uno reverse card on your person, then I believe it is scientifically proven that this whole dick can in fact fit inside your mouth. Which is fine if you're into that, but also you might not be, just be careful. The second thing I need to say is, I started doing the ice puzzle for this gym and then I had to pause midway through to go change, feed, and play with my daughter who woke up from a nap, and when I came back to finish the gym, I did not restart my recording, and I didn't have flashback recording set up at the time, so basically I suck and I'm stupid. I did write down exactly how the battle happened as soon as I noticed I wasn't recording, so I was able to use some incredible animation techniques to recreate it for your viewing pleasure. Please enjoy the show. With my team leveled up to the level cap, I challenge Ken Don't Say Her Name, and I lead off with Red Bull into her bitch ass Snover. I don't know why I'm being so aggressive about this Snover, I think just having to recreate this has made me angry, so you'll have to excuse that. Two crunches were enough to make this little root very past tense, and Ken didn't say it sends out Medicham. I have a pretty free switch in a Baja Blast, so I take it as Medi uses Bulk Up. On the next turn, I eat a rock slide for a decent chunk, and then I absolutely body bag this. You know what, I'm not gonna lie, I don't even know what Medicham is supposed to be to make fun of it, but either way, I body bag it with a play rough even through its bulk up boost. Cannot say her name sends out a Sneasel, and surprise, another play rough just picks up another KO. She then sends out her ace, thanks Obama Snow, and I have the perfect switch into Sugar Free Red Bull, predicting number 44 here to go for Aurora Veil. I think my play is gonna look really sweet because I'll set up the rain and prevent Aurora Veil from ever happening, but instead Barak just pops off with the Giga Drain which actually hits me incredibly hard. So I spend a couple of minutes running a calc just to triple check that I outpace with my diet energy drink, and I do. So I U-turn into Mio on the next turn, who absolutely snacks on a Giga Drain, and then a single flash cannon is enough to look. I thought really hard about how to make a tasteful joke about KOing a president, but I don't think it was ever gonna land well. I mean, don't get me wrong, the flash cannon landed and the Obama Snow got absolutely murked, but I just had to drop the whole president joke for this part. I 100% would have gone through with the joke if it was a gumshoes though. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this recreation. Sorry, I probably won't let this happen again, but also I might let it happen again. No time to dwell on the past though, because we have story to take care of. We show up to the lake Dehydrated was supposed to be taken care of, but he's dehydrated and useless, so we have to clean up his mess. We end up going through the massive galaxy headquarters where nothing is really challenging because the level scaling in this game is kind of weird, but we do fight Cyrus at the end. We're about to fight him for real though, and 
and this fight is honestly not very tough, so we'll skip it. At the end of the headquarters, we crush Saturn and then release the baby Mew trio back into the wild. They were probably captured because dehydrated is worthless. Just a guess. We then travel through Mount Corna and make our way to the Spear Pillar to wrap up the story portion of the game. We fight a double battle against Mars and Jupiter, but I set up the rain early and my battle partner is dehydrated, so I just surf a bunch and try to hydrate him in the process of also taking out the enemy Pokemon. We then come face to face with Cyrus one last time, and instead of taking his program seriously, he has been plotting the destruction of the world. Typical. I have to step up and be the friend he needs by absolutely body bagging him, so we challenge him. He leads off with Honchkrow, and I lead with Sugar Free Red Bull to set up the rain. I U-turn out on the first turn to bring in Red Bull, who gets off an Intimidate as the Honchkrow lands a critical hit air cutter that honestly doesn't do much damage. On the next turn, Red Bull outpaces and goes for a rain boosted waterfall, dropping the head Honchkrow. Oh, I get the name now. Head Honcho, Head Honchcrow, nice. Cyrus then sends out his own Gyarados, so I switch into Baja Blast to get rid of the Intimidate drop, and I take a Soft Crunch. On the next turn, Baja eats an Earthquake and lands a Play Rough for over half health. I'm not sure if I can take another Earthquake though, so I switch into Red Bull and go for a Crunch that drops my Evil Twin into the red and manages to get a Defense drop. I take a Crunch for much less damage, and after Cyrus uses a full Restore, two more Crunches finish this Imposter off. Cyrus sends in Crobat, who honestly doesn't have a great way to hurt Mio, so I switch into the Steel Penguin and wait. Why the hell does this Crobat have a Quick Claw? What is that good for? <laughs> I'm so confused. Is it just to tilt people into questioning why a Crobat has a Quick Claw? Whatever, Crobat U-turns into Weavile who takes a Surf for a little less than half, and on the next turn I go for a Flash Cannon as the Weavile digs, dodging my attack. So I switch into Sugar Free Red Bull to dodge his dig, and set up the rain. I U-turn into Matcha who can finally take advantage of her Swift Swim ability, and I pick up the two final kills with Rain Boosted Waterfalls. You absolutely love to see Matcha getting to shine. I know at least I do. Cyrus commits to actually bettering himself this time, which is good, but now I have to take care of the time god that he has unleashed upon the world. It's probably going to be a really hard battle, but oh, I can just run away I guess. Okay cool, I run away and the time demon god thing is defeated. Yay, let's go beat the game. Quick aside to that though, I'm not really sure how this new friendship mechanic works in this game because I never took my Pokemon to the park where you let them walk around, I never let my Pokemon follow me, I never put stickers on their Pokeballs, and this still happened on my way to the final city. Watch this. Pink Drink gets a friendship critical hit, a friendship dodge, another friendship crit, and then another friendship crit, all of this over the course of three turns. What is this nonsense? Why can we not turn this off? That is insane. I mean, I would win this fight either way, but that is simply too much. Just a really insane instance of this friendship mechanic that I wanted to show off. Okay, really, we're going to the eighth badge now. Once again, I'm cutting the level cap really close here, and in fact, Baja Blast actually does go over the cap, so I'm forced to add water to the team. Water is chilling around level 30 or 31, but I don't really need to level her up for her to contribute, so I just run through the gym and challenge Voltner. I lead off with Sugar Free Red Bull into his Raichu to set up the rain and immediately hard switch into water. You see, this Raichu only has electric attacks and surf, all of which water is immune to thanks to the ground typing and water absorbability. So I slowly but surely chip away at it until it goes down, which is pretty sweet since water is 15 levels lower. Then, Electric Man sends out his Ambipalm, so I switch into Mio and take a soft fake out, and I stay in on the next turn taking a relatively light Thunderbolt and chunking the monkey for most of its health with the Surf. On the next turn, an Aqua Jet finishes off Butt Hands here, and Octillery comes out. And oh boy, did I underestimate this Pokemon. I really thought that Octillery would be super easy to beat through, but it sets up a Focus Energy on the first turn as I switch into Water, and I expect it to go for an Octazooka since theoretically, that would be the hardest hitting move it has and the AI should have forgotten about my water absorbability, so I can yawn the octopus and put it to sleep and then take it out on my own pleasure, but no, it goes for Aurora Beam and gets a crit and mercs water, which is both a bad sign and our first death of the run. 
In the following turns, I am frantically switching in and out trying to get chip damage where I can and I end up getting it below half with an earth power from pink drink, but on the next turn a crit octazooka drops me to 5 HP. Had I just attacked here, I would have been fine, but I was trying to stay healthy so I clicked recover instead, which I'm now understanding is a mistake. Now I'm in a situation where I can't live another Octazooka, and I'm forced to play the switching game until I finally realize I just have to stay in with Red Bull and click crunch. If I keep switching, I will lose valuable pieces for the Elite Four, and every calc I'm looking at says this crunch has about a 25 to 60% chance to KO depending on what Octillery's HP is actually at. I'm not really good at gauging the HP bar, so I say YOLO, and I just click it, and we KO. I'm not really sure what my actual odds were here because I don't know what the exact percentage of its HP was at, but we got the KO and as always, I would rather be lucky than good. And I think I was kind of a combination of both in this instance. The electric man just has a sparky cat left and it can't actually do any meaningful damage to pink drink. So I recover up a bit for some safety and then we win with earth powers. And that is all eight badges with only water types and only one death kind of so far. I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong, we lost a Pokemon, but it was from the B team squad, so I don't think it counts as much. Still, rip rip water. It was dope seeing you 1v1 a Pokemon 15 levels higher than you. May you rest easy. Now, all we have left is the Elite Four and their incredibly souped up teams, and then Cynthia, who we will absolutely not be letting step on us anymore. Maybe. Also, her team is a nightmare, so we have to plan. On my way to Victory Road, I run into a Tentacruel, and I know I have to have this thing. I think Tentacruel offers us something we don't really have right now, and that is solid coverage and a way to hopefully 1v1 Cynthia's Milotic. Obviously, I could just set up Dragon Dances with Gyarados, but if you haven't noticed, I've not done that once this run, outside of training at least, because it seems kind of boring. Any Pokemon but Gyarados, and yes, I would be spamming the hell out of Dragon Dance, but it's already so broken, so if I'm not using setup strategies with it, I need to Pokemon to try and take my Lotic out, and Tentacruel seems like the best option. I catch her and name her Green Tea, one of my favorite drinks for one of my all-time favorite water types. I replace Red Bull, trek through Victory Road, grind for not joking here, hours trying to pay attention to what EVs I was giving my Pokemon. Then I go trade in Heart Scales for a couple of relearn moves, grab some items I missed along the way to piece together what sets I'll be using, stockpile on TMs I might need, and now it's time for the end game. I spent a while looking at these battles and honestly I don't think any of them aside from Cynthia will be ultra hard, so let's hope this confidence lasts. Okay, just kidding, I forgot Dehydrated shows up for one last battle, but this time his team is actually pretty good. Dare I say, a little hydrated even? I lead off with Sugar Free Red Bull into his Star Raptor because if you haven't caught on by now, setting up the rain is great for me. I click U-turn and my bird dodges his bird's U-turn and then I land my U-turn and get a critical hit. This friendship mechanic, once again, is wild. I switch out into Macha and Ice Fang on the next turn drops the Star Raptor and Dehydrated sends out Torterra. Thinking the four times super effective move will definitely one shot, I click Ice Fang again but this turtle is fat and it lives. But it wastes the turn it could be KOing me with by setting up Stealth Rocks. A waterfall in the next turn finishes the tortoise off. For some reason our rival thinks Rapidash is a good switch in here, but waterfall is enough to write this horse a very short obituary. Snorlax comes out next and the rain stops. So I switch into Sugar Free Red Bull and take some Stealth Rocks chip, but the Lax goes for a ground type move, so I essentially get in for free. I click Hurricane on the next turn to gauge damage, and it does about 30% and I get the confusion, but I don't think that's enough to leave SFRB in. So I U-turn out into Macha on the next turn as Totoro hits himself in confusion. A waterfall is enough to finish the sleepy plushie, and our parched rival sends out his own floatzel. I have a pretty significant level advantage here, so I KO it with a couple of crunches while only taking some small chip from his crunch. Finally, Dehydrated sends out a hair cross, but it doesn't even know a fighting type move for some reason, so I switch into Mio and drill peck it into Oblivion. Hydrate or dehydrate, man, let this be a lesson. Stay in school and drink water. I'm not really sure what school has to do with this, but your chances of having a successful life go up drastically if you stay in school, and your chances of not dying go up drastically if you drink water, so they kind of go hand in hand if you don't think about it. 
Okay, now for the real challenge. I decided on a level cap of 63, which is the highest level of a Pokemon on any Elite Four team, but the experience share will be chugging along the entire time too, so I think I'll probably end up around level 65 to 66. And 66 is the same level as Cynthia's Garchomp, so I think this is reasonable. With all of this out of the way, let's just get into it. First up is Aaron, and listen, I'm gonna shoot straight with you. This man is not super tough. Specializing in bug types is like asking to get bullied, so I do that. I lead Mio into his dust talks and set up stealth rocks for the residual damage over the course of the match, and then I proceed to peck at his moth until it drops. He then sends out a hair cross, and unlike the one we just fought, this one actually has a fighting type move, so I make the switch into Sugar Free Red Bull, taking a soft brick break. I click Hurricane after looking at Calyx and seeing I should live any attack this bug goes for, and I do. I manage to eat a facade and absolutely annihilate this hair across with a Hurricane. Aaron sends out his Beautiful Eye, which takes a ton of damage from Stealth Rocks, but I'm not comfortable staying in, so I switch into Mio. We take a soft hit and then KO on the next turn with a Drill Peck. Vespa Queen is next, and it also takes a massive chunk from switching in. It's decently bulky, but two Drill Pecks are enough to take down the Hive Queen. Aaron is down to just Drapion so I switch into Sugar Free Red Bull to negate the Earthquake I know it'll go for, and then switch straight into Pink Drink who is able to eat up a soft hit and then secure a knockout with Earth Power. Like I said, play with bugs and you're gonna get bullied. Sorry Aaron, maybe next time. Next up is Bertha who specializes in, uh, let me check my notes here, ground types? Let's just agree to speed run this one, okay? She leads off with Quagsire and Green Tea destroys it with a Giga Drain. She then sends in Golem, so I switch into Sugar Free Red Bull to dodge an Earthquake. Then I U-turn to break sturdy and go on to Pink Drink to eat a soft Stone Edge. Next, Pink Drink uses Scald for quite literally all the damage. Bertha sends out her fake tree, so I recover for some cushion health and then Scald again for quite literally all the damage because the fake tree has Rockhead instead of Sturdy. Wish Cash comes out next and it uses a pretty hard hitting Hydro Pump while I try to fish for a burn with Scald, but I am unsuccessful and I am for sure dead to a critical hit here. So I switch into SFRB taking another Hydro Pump and then I finish the Wish Cash off on the next turn with the Surf. Her last Pokemon is a Hippo, so I switch into Baja Blast to eat up a Crunch and then I reestablish the food chain order on the next turn by absolutely bodying this Hippo with an Aqua Tail. Bertha was always is going to be easy. Next, oh, next is Flint, the fire type trainer with a really odd fire type team. I think it's cool the teams are a little diverse, but this one is sad. Let's speed run it too. I set up rain on the first turn and absolutely drown a horse, and then I switch into my slug to eat up an electric bite from a metal coated ground snake and drop it with one earth power. A bunny comes out, so I use Rock Slide, which is a physical move, because for some reason this bunny knows Mirror Coat, and it did go for Mirror Coat, so I switch into Matcha. But this time, the bunny goes for a dangerous kick and misses, so it takes hella damage because it's dumb and stupid. Waterfall takes it out on the next turn. A hot air balloon replaces the bunny on the field, and it takes a ton from Crunch, but then it heals with a Citrus Berry and burns my Lifeguard Weasel. I know the balloon will start to use Minimize to increase its evasion, so I switch into Sugar Free Red Bull whose hurricane bypasses accuracy checks when it's in the rain. One hurricane finishes the job here, and Flint sends out his last Pokemon, a fire monkey that can use electric punches. So I switch into Pink Drink for free here on the Thunder Punch, and then on the next turn I absolutely swallow a close combat and drop the monkey to its Focus Sash with an Earth Power. On the following turn, I outright KO it as Flint goes for a full restore. Okay, so the middle two Elite Four members have been kind of a joke for the Mono Water team, but let's see about the penultimate battle of the run. Lucian is the last Elite Four member and he uses Psychic types and his team is actually pretty good. He leads off with his Mr. Mime as I lead off with Baja Blast, and his Mime sets up a Reflect on turn one, but I get the best friend critical hit and that silly Reflect did absolutely nothing as the Mime drops in one hit. Next up is Girafferig, which is actually such a style points Pokemon. And since Reflect is up and this Giraffe knows Thunderbolt, I switch into Pink Drink. After a back and forth of trading Psychics, Earth Powers, healing up, and some switching around on my end, we end up in a spot where the Giraffe sets up a Trick Room in front of Mio. So I switch back into Pink Drink who will always outspeed the Giraffe in Trick Room and finish it off with an Earth Power. Lucian sends out Metacham next, and I stay in to fish for a burn with Scald, but holy, this thing manages to land a high jump kick and does a ton of damage to me. I switch into Baja Blast and get the friendship dodge on the next high jump kick, which almost kills it, and then I just knock it out on the next turn. 
Alakazam comes out next, and knowing I can live any one attack, I just use Waterfall and it drops. Alakazam's physical defense is paper thin. Rumor has it, Baja Blast even took one of his spoons with him. Lucian sends out his ace, Bronzong, so I go into Mio to soak up some damage and eat the Future Sight as a resisted hit. I then bring out Sugar Free Red Bull to negate an Earthquake, and two Rain Boosted Surfs are enough to seal the deal. That's it. The Elite Four is beaten with zero deaths and only water types. This is such a good feeling, but it doesn't last for long because I know what comes next and it won't be easy. Our hardest challenge of the run is staring directly at us, and even though we've come prepared, I'm not sure I can just not let Cynthia step on me. Oh wait, that's not the challenge at all. You mean we have to just battle? That's probably a little bit of an easier challenge, but her team is absolutely disgusting. I move some items around, and this is the team I will be going into the champion battle with. So we have a plan, we just have to see if it works. I lead off with Baja Blast into her Spiritomb, which can normally be an insanely hard Pokemon to break through, but Baja Blast lands a play rough on the first turn and we just drop this spooky ghost thing. Adding fairy types into this game really lessened the efficacy of Spiritomb. Good start for us. Cynthia sends out her Roserade next, and we already know we struggle against this Pokemon, so I switch into Mio, and we actually get the best friend dodge on the first turn, which doesn't feel great, and then over the next few turns, we take two pretty hard energy balls and knock the Rose out with two drill packs. I would have had to have changed my play if we didn't dodge that first energy ball, but we did. And honestly, that was one of our biggest obstacles, so I'm glad to have it down, even if we did cheese it a little. Gastrodon is next, so I switch into Sugar Free Red Bull to dodge an Earthquake, and since my bird is wearing some glasses, Hurricane is guaranteed to two-hit KO. So her slug drops, and now the absolute most difficult Pokemon to break comes out, Milotic. We've kind of been crushing her team up to this point, but this Milotic is so bulky that it's a threat just from how hard it is to take down. I start off by going for a Hurricane, but Milotic Scalds do way too much damage in the rain, and I need Sugar Free Red Bull to stick around. I switch into Matcha, but I realize this is terrible because if she gets burned from a Scald, it's not likely I can overcome that with my current game plan. So I switch into Green Tea, who I kind of picked up for this job in the first place. I go for Giga Drain, which does an amazing amount of damage, but it's because I managed to snag a crit here. I switch out into Baja Blast on the next turn predicting a Mirror Coat, but instead I get burned from a Scald, miss a play rough, and then Milotic heals with Recover. Eventually Baja Blast realizes we're best friends, so she snaps out of her burn, and we just keep landing play roughs as the Milotic heals. I switch into Green Tea on a predicted heal and go for a Giga Drain, then switch on a Mirror Coat, and we play this game for a while. Eventually I switch into Mio as a pivot, and I get dropped to 9 HP and burned, but we shed the burn on the same turn through the power of friendship. I go into Green Tea, and I play super loose thinking that Milotic won't be baited into a Mirror Coat if I go for Surf before Giga Drain because the damage difference is so massive, but it goes for Mirror Coat on my Giga Drain anyway and Green Tea is now burned from a Scald and almost drops which is the worst situation I think I could possibly be in. In desperation, I switch into Sugar Free Red Bull and start firing off Hurricanes to try and get a confusion and I do. I switch back into green tea hoping I can get some luck going in my favor, and two Giga Drains later, I finally drop this beautiful fish. I'm not going to lie to you, I really thought this was good game, but we made it through even with a bit of sloppy play. Lucario comes out next, and I don't really have any options here. Green Tea has kind of served her purpose, so I go for one final surf to get some chip damage off, and then she drops to a flash cannon. You will be missed, Green Tea. You were the newest addition, but you still did great. I send out Sugar Free Red Bull to set up the rain, and because she should theoretically bait a Dragon Pulse, so I switch into Baja on the predicted pulse, and I call the turn right. I lock into Waterfall thinking I'll always live any attack, but I was wrong. This flash cannon should have knocked me out, but because Baja Blast is my best friend, she gets a free focus sash, and it kicks in here, and then the Lucario drowns under the waterfall. This doesn't change a ton because Macha could have picked up this KO with a clean switch in either way, but it's worth pointing out once again how utterly insane this friendship mechanic is. Cynthia sends out her final Pokemon, her ace Garchomp, and if she decides to set up a Sword Stance, I could just win right here. I lock into Waterfall, but the Land Shark actually goes for Poison Jab, making Baja Blast a historic figure. You did good work, Bubba. Rest easy. 
With the rain still up, I switch into Matcha. I have to click Waterfall here because it should always two hit KO in the rain and it's 100% accurate with a 30% chance to flinch. Whereas Ice Fang is not 100% accurate, has a lesser chance to flinch and it might not even two shot because the Garchomp is holding a Yachi Berry. The flinch chance also really matters here because if the Garchomp goes for a sword stance, I just win either way. But if the Garchomp goes for an earthquake, that actually has a chance to one shot Matcha and that could just end my run. So I lock in to waterfall and the Garchomp just goes for Swords Dance. That is insane. Cynthia, you're far too greedy. On the next turn, I click waterfall again and we lay this absolute nightmare of a Pokemon to rest. We've done it. We've beaten a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Brilliant Diamond using only water types. This feels absolutely insane for my first time playing through the game, but I definitely have some thoughts about the run and these games in general. Before I get into them, I would like to know who you think the MVP of the run is. I have my thoughts, but I'll keep them to myself for now so I don't taint the results. Okay, so as for my thoughts on the run, I think it would be wild of me not to admit how fortunate having a weather setter was. I know it's roughly a 50-50% chance when catching a Wingle, but Drizzle Pelipper is insane. The Merrill in the Great Marsh is also such a massive piece. I think I could have done the run without these two specific Pokemon, but it would have definitely been harder. It's also worth noting I played this game at a much slower pace than people who uploaded their runs on day one or two of the game being released. That gave me a lot more information to work with, which I think is a massive advantage when you're doing these runs. As for these games, they're simultaneously incredibly hard and very easy depending on your RNG. I didn't really notice the friendship mechanic kicking in often until after the seventh gym, but after that, it happened way more than I would like. Like. The gym leaders and elite four members have strong teams with real stats, but sometimes you get a best friend power and it just bails you out. I wish we could turn this feature off somehow, I think it would make the end game infinitely more challenging and infinitely more fun. I didn't even do any of the friendship stuff, but I guess it just happens naturally. Anyway, I still had a ton of fun with this and I'm already planning my next run, so hopefully you're stoked for that. Thank you so much for watching and thank you so much for all the continued support on these videos, it means so much to me. That being said, my name is Vivid and I'm kinda done here so I have to leave. Bye.